I want to preach today on the subject of whosoever will. And then next week, uh, I'm going to preach on the one word. It's called forgiveness. Forgiveness. And uh, I think sometimes that is the hardest thing for, for even Christians to do. I've had this, these two subjects that I'm talking about this next two weeks, they've been on my mind for months, not just weeks, but just for months. Because in my counseling and in all that I do, a lot of it ties it in there. And then after these two weeks, we'll get back to our study in Acts. Uh, if you have your Bible with you, please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Whosoever will is what we are going to be talking about today. Uh, if you had a, a, a program there and you want to fill in the blanks on that, let me give you the outline. Number one, God has chosen us. He has chosen us. Aren't you glad God chose you? Ooh, that was pretty weak there. I'm going to say it again. Aren't you glad God chose you? There we go. Number two, God has forgiven us. Folks, I could not live another day without the forgiveness of God. I just couldn't do it. And number three, God has given us a guarantee. A guarantee. And folks, when God makes a promise, it is guaranteed to happen, folks. Guaranteed. You know, I truly want to share my heart with you today. I am not upset any person or a group of people I'm just concerned about the direction of some churches and our Southern Baptist Convention uh, seems to be taking. Uh, just because you have been taught or thought one way on some doctrinal issue doesn't necessarily make it so. A lot of time we follow the traditions of others. But listen to this statement. I know you're pondering what I've said, but listen to this one. I believe the Word of God is the absolute authority on who we are and what we believe. It is the Word of God. It does not matter what I think. Okay? It matters what the Word of God says. And that's very important. In John chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible teaches us that Jesus is the Word. He is the living Word. And Hebrews 13, 8 tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And another scripture I want you to go to first before we launch out here is 2 Peter 1. Go to 2 Peter 1 with me if you would. 2 Peter 1, verse 19 and 20. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you, well, uh, which you do well to heed as light that shines in a dark place. Folks, we are living in days of darkness. You can see that all around us. God sent the Word, the Holy Word, the Old Testament and the New Testament to shine light on who He is and what He is about. In a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your heart. Twofold, it's talking about salvation and it's talking about Jesus Christ. Now here's the one. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man. Because what some people say, men wrote the Word of God, but they were under divine inspiration of God. That's the key. And spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Man has no business changing God's holy word for any reason. We're also taught to follow God, not man, on any so-called doctrine of man. So with a huge burden about this message, I will show you through God's holy word how the Holy Spirit wants us to believe on predestination and election. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, of Jesus Christ, and we know an apostle is one who has been set apart. Another definition could be a messenger uh, by Jesus Christ, by the will of God. It was God who called him to salvation. It was God that called him to the ministry, to the saints. And again, I've had some people say, well, I know some of your members, they ain't saints. <laughs> All right, And folks, none of us truly are saints the way we 
think of the word saints, but it simply says to the Christians, okay, to the Christians who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Folks, we are not perfect. I understand that. We are not. We all fail God. We all come short of God's glory. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ our Lord. And let me give you just short definitions. Election. Salvation begins with God. Okay, election. He elected us. Salvation begins with God. Predestination is to ordain beforehand. Okay? Salvation begins with God. Predestination is to ordain beforehand. Now look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Folks, we are a blessed people. We are a blessed people. I mean, you just think of the blessings of God. If you woke up today and you're breathing God's air, you are blessed. If you had a heater and a warm car to come to church in, you are blessed. If you have food on the table, you are blessed. God blesses us not only with physical things, but every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And he's talking about heaven, folks. Heaven. Not only this, we get to be Christians. We, we get to be loved by God. We are blessed by God. And when you think about a heaven, here's what he's saying. In a way, we are already there. Think about that. Folks, I know when I die, when I take my last breath on earth, the Bible says to be absent with God, uh, be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I get to spend all of eternity with our Savior and Lord and God. Folks, we are blessed with every spiritual blessing. Now look at verse 4. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. He did not say He chose you before you were born. Think about this. And folks, you have to understand the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God is He is the supreme power. He is the supreme authority. He has always been. Nobody created God. God has always been. So He has to say so in this. And most people think, well, He chose me once He figured out who I was. No, He didn't, folks. According to the Word of God, you were chosen before... That's before creation. Before Genesis. He chose you already it, before the foundation of the world that we should be holy without blame before Him in love. So we see uh, uh, election there. Election is God chose us. And I say it again, folks. Thank God that He chose you. Thank God that He chose me. And He did that because of love. Now look at verse 5. Having predestined us to the adoptions as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself. And again, He knows us personally. The Bible says He knows the number of hairs on our head. And what that is saying is, it is initiated by God. It is 100% God. But it's also Man, also man. And when I say man, I'm not saying the power of man. I'm saying the free will of man. God, before the world even was in existence, knew you, had the sovereignty and the power to know you and know how you would respond to the Word of God. And when you think about that, that just blows me away, folks. To know the mighty power, the sovereignty, the omnipotence of God knowing these things. And I'll say this right here and I'll say it again. It comes down to divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Divine sovereignty. God in salvation. God knowing. And you think, here's the key folks. God has always given us a choice. We are not puppets on a string. 
God doesn't make us serve Him. And I'll share a couple of examples of what I am talking about there. Think of Adam and Eve. Did God say, you are going to fall? He said, no. He put them in the garden and says, there's only one thing that you cannot do. And what did they do? The very thing that He told them not to do. He didn't make them do that. They chose. I'll tell you something else that blows me away is Judas. How can Judas, who had been around Jesus for three and a half years, ignore the call of God? That's what whosoever will means. Folks, it is backed by Scripture. It wasn't a random act. It wasn't a random act. God wasn't in heaven and was looking over His children and said, hey, you, you're going to heaven, you're going to heaven, you're going to heaven, you're going to hell, you're going to hell, you're going to hell. That's not how it is, folks. It is initiated by God. And He uh, allows us the freedom of choice. And if you do not choose God, folks, it's your own fault. It's your own fault. And, and with that, I understand God has to call you. He really does. We're going to go through a series of Scripture here. All right? 2 Peter 3, 9. We're just going to kind of rapid fire these off here. Not to be in a hurry, but just, just to read them. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Bible says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us. Folks, Two times before I got saved, God called me to salvation when I was five years old. God called me to salvation when I was 14. And both times, I thought I did what I needed. But deep down in my life, I knew it wasn't true. And it wasn't until I was 22 years old that I truly heard the call of God and understood the call of God and understood that I was a lost church member. And here's why he's not coming yet. It says, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. He wants everyone saved. But not everyone's going to be saved. It's a choice. It's a choice of faith. It's a choice of repentance. It's a choice of believing the truth from the Word of God. So we see God doesn't want anyone to perish. Also, just the verse that everyone knows, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. He made a way for us to be saved. He knew what Adam and Eve was going to do. And He made a way for us to be saved. That Look at this word, whosoever. Folks, that's all-encompassing. That means every one of us can be saved. It doesn't mean we will be saved, but we can be saved. Who believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans 10, 13. Romans 10, 13, for, look at the word, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. God knows us personally. God knows us in, you know, intimately. God knew what we were going to do. And he, the, the Holy Spirit uh, called us to salvation. But I'm telling you, uh, you have to respond. You have to respond to that. 1 Peter 2.9 1 Peter 2.9 Look at 1 Peter 2 verse 9 But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people. Do you ever th think about the children of Israel? Why were they God's chosen people? You know why? Because that's who He chose. It's a God thing. Okay? He could have chose someone else, but He chose uh, Israel as a holy nation that you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into a marvelous light. Folks, I was a sinner. I wasn't seeking God. God came after me. He came after me. John 6, 44. John 6, 44. Go back to John 6, 44. John 6, 44. Well, I'm having trouble finding it. 
John 6, 44, And Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Do not murmur among yourself. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Folks, it is the drawing of the Holy Spirit. It is our response to the Holy Spirit. And then look at Romans 8, 29. Romans 8, 29. Romans 8, 29 says, For whom He foreknew, God knew us. He also predestined us to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, He predestined these He also called. Whom He called, these He also justified. And whom He justified, He also glorified. Folks, I'm telling you, it is the divine sovereignty of God and human responsibility. The thing that really is, you know, and in, in, in folks, I have prayed and I have prayed and I've prayed. And at one time in my life, I was a 3.5 Calvinist. There are five Calvinists. But the more I study Scripture, the more, and again, folks, I have nothing against John Calvin. I'm not calling him out. I'm simply saying this is my opinion. This is what I believe. It's kind of like the word uh, reformation period or reformation theology. Let me tell you what I believe about this. I believe the Word of God is perfect. Reformation theology. Thought, theology. Our theology doesn't need to be reformed. To see, some people take it back to the Reformation time. But if you truly think where we are from, and I'm not talking about the Baptist faith and message, we support that, I believe that, and I'm going to follow that. But if you think about our origins, it goes all the way back to Acts chapter 2 in the New Testament church. That's where our theology begins. Now, how are you going to improve on that, folks? And that's what happens sometimes. Uh, I have friends that are Calvinists. Okay, I know preachers that that are Calvinists, and that's their choice. I'm just saying, uh, I believe the Scripture when it comes, and and it's kind of like politics in some ways. There are just some things I don't discuss with a couple of my sisters when it comes to politics. Why? Because we're going to disagree. And folks, the same thing is true here. We will disagree, but we will, uh, you know, we, we can still have fellowship. We can still be friends. But let me give you the five points of Calvinism. The T, they call it the tulip. Uh, total depravity, okay? And, and here's the deal about Calvinists too. There are five kinds of Calvinists. Okay, you have the, you know, on a scale of one to five, there's five different kinds. So, when I say Calvinist, I'm going to say some because some of them don't even agree with, like, if you're a one and a five, there are going to be things that you don't agree on, okay? Total depravity. Some believe that there are people that are unredeemable. You, unconditional election, some believe that, that there are others who cannot be saved. L is limited atonement. Some believe Jesus died just for the saved. Okay? I, irresistible call. You will be saved no matter what. If God, if God elects you, if He chooses you, you will be saved. Matter of fact, in Lawton, Oklahoma, when I was a youth minister, uh, an evangelist came through there, he said you would come kicking and screaming down the aisles whether you want to be saved or not. And folks, I had the hardest time with that. Okay, I, I really did. And then P is perseverance of the saints, which I do agree with. That's basically security of the believer. Doctrinal issues are important. Another issue, when you think of how can these two things line up, folks, I am telling you it is hard to explain. But think about Jesus. Jesus was 100% God, 100% man. Okay? In it, sometimes even in my mind, I believe it with all my heart, but it's hard to wrap our minds 
around that. But God has never predestined anyone to hell, folks. And what he is saying is, it is both. It is divine sovereignty and a human responsibility. And the key there is, folks, Jesus Christ. Folks, He is the reason we worship. He is the reason that we live. Everything evolves around Him. So we see God has chosen us. Now go back to our Scripture, if you would. Verse 5, having predestined us to the adoptions as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Why did he adopt us? Because he wants to have fellowship. He wants fellowship. What do you think we are going to be doing the rest of our lives, folks? We are going to be in heaven. We are going to see the glory of God. We are going to have, and folks, I love our worship services. I love our music. But I'm telling you, multiply it by thousands and thousands and thousands in heaven. We will all be worshiping our Lord and our Savior. And then it says, to the praise of the glory of His grace by which He made us accepted in the beloved. Folks, we all have been rejected before. We all have been the last one picked before. And I am telling you, God loves you. God wants to spend eternity with you. God sent His Son to die for you. But folks, you have to accept Him into your life. You have to repent of your sins. You have to know who Jesus Christ is and what He has done in your life. So God has chosen us. Second thing I want you to see, God has forgiven us. He has chosen us, and He has forgiven us. Look in verse 7. In Him we have redemption through His blood. What is redemption? There was a price that has to be paid. A price has to be paid. For us to be saved, a price has to be paid, and that price was the blood of Jesus Christ. According to the riches of His grace, Folks, I've got a father, and I've got a heavenly father, and i got news for you. He's rich. He's rich. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns all the gold. I mean, his streets. We put cement and blacktop on our streets. His streets are made of gold, according to the Word of God. We have been forgiven, which made us to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. And folks, I'm telling you, the forgiveness of sin is a wonderful thing. The forgiveness means to cancel a debt. We had a debt we could not pay. And Christ paid for that debt. And and we are forgiven. Colossians 2. Go to Colossians 2 with me if you would. Colossians 2.13 and you being dead in your trespasses, that was before Christ, and the uncircumcision of your flesh. He has made alive together with Him, having forgiven you all your trespasses. Psalms tells us, as far as the east is from the west, He has forgiven us. Folks, all of our sin, He is buried. Another verse says, in the ocean, He has buried it. And here's verse 14. Having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that was against us. What is that? The law. It was the law. We have all broken God's law. And we all need God's grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. Mercy is not giving us what we deserve. Grace is giving us what we don't deserve. Because I was a sinner, I deserved death. I deserve hell, but God paid a price for me. God has forgiven me. When I think of the thief on the cross and two thieves standing there, it's a perfect picture of redemption. 
One says, if you really are the Son of God, why don't you uh, take us down? Why don't you get us out of this? If you claim to be who you are, get us out of this mess. And the other one just said, Father, would you just remember me? Humbly remember me. And Jesus said, today I will be with you in paradise. Folks, he nailed our sin to the cross. He became sin for us. 1 John 1. Go with me to 1 John 1. 1 John 1 verse 8. 1 John 1 8. The Bible says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Folks, I'm telling you, I have never presented the gospel to somebody and someone says to me, I've never sinned. Everybody understands that they are sinners, but just understand that that you are a sinner doesn't save you. Verse 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh folks, it's that forgiveness that we need in our life. That forgiveness And even as Christians, every day, every night, every night, every day, every night, we need to ask ourselves three questions. Am I right with God? Am I right with my fellow man? Am I right with my family? Because the forgiveness of God is there. Verse 10, and if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Oh, folks, we are all sinners saved by grace. So we see back in our Scripture, look back in our Scripture at Ephesians. Let's finish this section. Ephesians 1, the Bible says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness. Verse 10 was where I wanted to finish that in the dispensation of the fullness of time he may gather together in one all the things in Christ. What is the dispensation of time, folks? Galatians, it says, when Jesus came. When he came the first time. Okay, he was born of a virgin. Okay, he lived a perfect life. He died on a cross. And after three days, he arose. That was Jesus, 100% God, 100% man. And now he is sitting at the right hand of God. But I'm telling you, you know what he's waiting for now? Folks, he's waiting for the rapture of the church. One person sometime is going to walk down in the hall or it may be somebody even witnessing to somebody in a pickup truck. And that person is going to get saved. And God is going to look over and say, go get my bride. And folks, when that happens, I am telling you, you know, Jesus is going to come and rapture the Christians out of this place. So God has chosen us. God has forgiven us. And God has given us a guarantee. Man, don't you like guarantees, folks? I don't know about you, but I love guarantees. It says in verse 11, in him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. What have we got? We've obtained an inheritance. Now you realize on earth to get an inheritance, somebody's got to die, okay? But I'm telling you, Jesus has already died. He has already paid. And we are going to be partakers in those benefits. That One of the benefits is eternal life. One of the benefits is a perfect body. One of the benefits is being in heaven where there is no sin, no sorrow, nothing. Okay, nothing. It's our eternal home. Heaven is our eternal home. And God has given this as a guarantee. Folks, I, it's not one of them, well, I hope so. Preacher, I hope you're right. Folks, according to the Word of God, God is always right. 
He is giving us this inheritance. And it says, verse 12, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of His glory. I've heard a few people even in my witnessing to say, you know, their first year or something, they are struggling, okay? They're just struggling to be a Christian. And I even heard a guy ask me one time, why doesn't God, just when we get saved, take us straight out of here? Why don't we, you know, and that's not a bad deal, I'm telling you. It really isn't, but that's not how it works, folks. We are here to reflect God's glory. We are here to, sh uh, to share this love of Christ. We are here to share the gospel with others. And folks, the truth of the matter is we can, we can uh, speed up the rapture of the church coming by the more people we lead to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's what the Word says. But we are to the praise of His glory. Verse 13, in Him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. What's the word of truth? The word of God, the gospel, your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Folks, I am telling you, God quickens us. God uh, comes into our life. And, and I'm telling you, God is the one. Uh, he, he just says that, that it will always be there for us. And, and at the point of salvation, we accept Jesus Christ. And, and God and Jesus uh, are, you know, are there. Their, their grip is upon us. And then the Holy Spirit is wrapped around us. So for, for us not to be saved, and folks, we believe once saved, always saved. Some would ha would have, someone would have to break the seal of the Holy Spirit, take away Jesus' hand, and take away God's hand. And folks, there's nobody that can do that. Nobody can do that. We are sealed. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Verse 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. There's that phrase again. Guaranteed inheritance. Redemption of the purchased possession. Folks, we are a child of the King. A child of the King. Look with me in John 10. John 10, verse 27. John 10, 27. The Bible says, and this is Jesus speaking, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. Does God know you? Does God know you? Does Jesus know you? And they follow me. And I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Never perish, folks. We're good as Christians. I say once saved, truly saved, Always saved. Because there is such a thing of a false profession of faith. It's in Matthew chapter 13. But if you truly get saved, you will always be saved. Verse 29, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. And then Romans 8. Go with me to Romans 8, last verse. Romans 8, 37. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Oh, folks, it wears me out sometimes. How you doing? Oh, okay. How you doing? Oh, I'm treading water. How you doing? Oh, you don't want to know, preacher. How you feeling? Oh, it would take too long. Folks, we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now look at verse 38. For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Satan is rapid on this earth right now. He is 
I'm telling you, he is on steroids right now. Why? Because he knows his time is about finished. And he is pressing us. He is persecuting us. He wants us to doubt. And the Bible says that we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Folks, I understand the need at the White House. We need law and order. But folks, it is in heaven. Heaven anoints everything here on earth. Nothing takes God by surprise. And my loyalty is to God and to the Word of God. Verse 39, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Remember one time, Lori and I were shopping and Sarah Jane was with us and she's about four years old. And we were in a department store and you know how those racks have those round things. And we just for a minute looked away and we couldn't find Sarah Jane. You talk about parents panicking. And we looked and we looked and all at once we shouted holler and Sarah Jane, Sarah Jane. And she got scared because we were upset. And she was right in the middle of those deals. The first thing I thought of, I'm going to take her to the bathroom and take care of this business. But the second thing was, She's safe. She's safe. Folks, children are a gift from God. They are precious to God. And we are precious to God, folks. He secures us. He loves us. He blesses us. He takes care of us. Everything we are is in Christ Jesus, folks. We have to keep Jesus and God in the center of our relationship. With all things, folks, we have a guarantee. Father, thank you for this day. and God, I thank you, thank you, thank you that you chose us. And Lord, I don't have all the answers to, you know, predestination and election. I do know you are divinely sovereign. I do know that we have to respond. I know what whosoever will means. So God, I pray that we just understand that we are God's adopted children. You are our Heavenly Father. You're always there. You never leave us. You never forsake us. So God, I thank you for forgiveness. I thank you for the guarantee. And God, I pray that if there's just one here, that doesn't know you. God, I pray today would be their day of salvation. God, and I pray for the Christian. Lord, we were made for praise. We were made for God's glory. And I pray as we look at 2021 that we will show forth your glory and show forth your praise. God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you. So God, this is your invitation. God, this is your church. I pray you do with it what you choose. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come? As you stand to your feet, would you come?